right, so far we've talked quite a bit about the general machinery of spectral sequences. And of course, we've come up with a spectral sequence that tells us something about the cohomology of a space, but we haven't done any examples and uh, talked about really specific types of spectral sequences. So I want to talk about the Bockstein spectral sequence in the next few videos. And some good references here are Mosier and Tangora and also McCleary. Um, and, and in fact, probably many others, but I was looking at these when I was writing these notes. So, uh, let's set P to be some prime and let's think about X being a CW complex. So what I want to do is, uh, talk about where the Bockstein comes from. So I'll start with a short exact sequence that looks like zero goes to the integers, goes to the integers by the times p map, and then of course quotients to z mod p, and that's a short exact sequence, and that gives me a short exact sequence of chain complexes. So if I want to look at uh, the cellular or singular chain complex, or I could do co-chain complex, let's just do co-chain complex for now. Then really the same short exact sequence in a sense, uh, just tensoring with my co-chain complex gives me this. Okay, so I've got this short exact sequence and this is gonna induce a long exact sequence in cohomology. As usual, whenever we have a short exact sequence of chain complexes, we get such a thing. So this will start with the cohomology of X I guess start is not really the something that makes sense in the context of a long zag sequence, but that's where I'll start writing. I'll, I'll multiply by P, and that gives me the cohomology of X. If I leave off the coefficients, I mean integral coefficients. And then uh, I can reduce mod P and get the cohomology of X in mod P coefficients. And then my connecting homomorphism, which I'll call beta, is going to take me to the n plus first homology, cohomology of x, and so on. Keep going. And the reason I call that beta is uh, really that it's traditionally called beta in this context. This is called the Bockstein. So the Bockstein beta is just our connecting homomorphism. And the spectral sequence we're after is related to this. Of course, we're after the Bockstein spectral sequence. Okay, so uh, we want to investigate first what this beta does. And of course, we know there's uh, a long sac sequence coming from the snake lemma. So that's what gives us this connecting homomorphism. But what does it actually do for us here? We take some little x and what should we get? Okay, so let's chase it through in this particular case so that we make sure that we understand it. And I see I haven't planned my page well. This isn't going to fit very well. Uh, so it might be a little bit choppy. Actually, maybe let me just give myself some space. So what I wanna do is go back to the, the chain complex, the co-chain complex. And so I'll start with Cn of x maps to Cn of x, that's the times p map, maps to Cn of x tensored with z mod p. Okay, and so that's one level of the short exact sequence. And let's get another level in here. So there's uh, the differential in the chain complex connecting those. Oops, that should be Cn plus one and Cn plus one. Okay, and of course this looks basically the same. So this is reduce mod P. Here I've got the differentials. And so that's just the short exact sequence at another level. And so what I wanna do here is take some uh, 
you know what, actually I, I can tell that I'm going to want more, so let me keep going. So that's the n plus 2 of x. This is just uh, the differential again. Of course, d squares would be 0. Just continue. Um, let's put cn plus 2 of x here as well. And so on. Okay, again, that's the differential. Put those on the same level. Okay, so this is what I mean about crossing over the page. But all right, so now let's chase this element x through here. So I've got some little x, and uh, the fact that it's an element in the nth homology means, of course, that it goes to zero under the differential. And that means that there's some, uh, what do I want to say? I want to say that there's this, this map here is surjective. So there's some class, let's call it Y, or I might really call it X and call this other one X bar or something like that. This is just uh, the thing before we've reduced mod P. Okay, but there's some class y in cn of x, and we can apply the differential to that. We get delta y, and of course the square commutes, so that goes to zero. But again, we have exactness here, and, uh, well, not again, sorry. We have exactness in this short exact sequence at the n plus first level, and so because this delta y goes to zero, it must lift back to something in cn plus 1 of x over here on the left. And what should that thing on the left be? Well, this map over is times p. So it must have looked like 1 over p delta y, and then we multiplied by p, and we got delta y. Okay, so let's just say there exists this element, and this is precisely the thing that we're after. So we'll say x goes to 1 over p delta y. Okay. Uh, Great. Now, I should make sure that that's something that's actually in the homology. But of course, if I do the differential again here, then I get zero. And maybe that doesn't immediately tell me that I get zero over here on the left, but I have that this uh, left-hand side map is injective. And so the only thing that goes to zero making this diagram commute is zero. So indeed, this is a homology class. Okay, that doesn't tell me that it's a non-zero homology class, but that does tell me uh, that I've landed in Hn plus 1 of x. Okay, so uh, that's all well and good. And of course, when I started with this x, I started with the homology class. You should do the diagram chase to make sure that um, you believe that this is well-defined, but probably that should have happened in more general context when you were proving such a long sex sequence exists. In any case, what that tells us is now we do know what this beta connecting homomorphism does. So we've got Hn of x in mod p coefficients. We've got beta is our connecting homomorphism in the long x sequence. Goes to Hn plus 1 of x uh, in integral coefficients. And we now know that little x should go to something that looks like 1 over p delta y. All right, and we could now map that to hn plus 1 of x in mod p coefficients just by reducing mod p. And when we do that, I suppose this just goes to whatever we get reduced mod p. So I'll just call that 1 over p delta y bar, whatever class we get. And this entire composition is called delta 2. And unfortunately, this can be a little bit confusing, delta 2 is also called the Bockstein. So it really depends on the context you're in, which one you're talking about. OK, so we've got this delta 2. and uh, one reason that it's also called the Bockstein is the result of the following exercise. So delta 2 is actually the connecting homomorphism in much the same way as what we just did associated to a different short exact sequence. So 
So it's the short exact sequence where we have zero goes to Z mod two, which includes into Z mod four and quotients back down to Z mod two. Okay, so uh, in a sense, it's also the connecting homomorphism to a short exact sequence. So it's still called the Bockstein. But even in this particular context, we call them both the Bockstein. So just be careful, that can be a little bit confusing. Okay, so uh, the whole point of setting all of this up is that now we have an exact couple. So we've now talked about the compact version of an exact couple. And our exact couple is going to look like we'll take d1 to be the homology of x with integral coefficients. Well, then over here I have d again, so same thing. And this will just be, uh, I guess I'll call it i1, but it's really just the times p map that we saw in our long sex sequence. And then down at the bottom, what will be e1 is going to be the cohomology of x in mod p coefficients. So I've got a map j1 and a map k1. And k1, this is precisely our Bockstein, our first Bockstein, the connecting homomorphism beta. And j1 is coming from that long exact sequence, so this is reduce mod p. And we know that from an exact couple, we can define a differential and get a derived exact couple and so on and so forth. So what's our differential here going to be? It's d1, which is j1 after k1. And uh, j1 after k1, that's beta. Um, sorry, that's reduce mod p after doing beta. If I scroll back up just a little bit, if we reduce mod p after doing beta, that's precisely what we call delta 2. So uh, this is really just the other box stein. Okay, so we often say the differential here is the box stein. And uh, in the usual way, from an exact couple, we get a spectral sequence. And the spectral sequence we get here is what we call the box stein spectral sequence. Now, notice something a little bit weird here, which is that D and E that we're starting with here, or D1 and E1, just because I want to start on the E1 page with this D1 being our other box time, uh, these are actually just singly graded. Okay, usually when we've seen an exact couple like this and gotten to a spectral sequence, it came from some filtered object and we ended up with something bi-graded. But I said at the time that you'll get whatever grading the objects have. So in this case, we'll end up with a spectral sequence that's just singly graded. Okay, and we'll come back to that later. But in any case, uh, if we really wanna understand this spectral sequence, we should think through what's actually happening here and one way to do that is to ask, how can we understand the higher differentials? What's really happening in the spectral sequence? Okay, so I mean that in the sense of what we just did. We know the long exact sequence had a connecting homomorphism, but we investigated what that connecting homomorphism actually looks like in this case. I wanna know what these higher differentials look like in this particular case. So the first thing we'll do is get the derived couple from this exact couple. And so we get D2, which remember is just a, a sub thing of D1. Get the induced map I2. And then E2 is our homology of E1 with respect to our differential. And we get these maps J2 and K2. And then always in our derived couple, the next differential is just J after K. So as usual, but what does that actually do, right? So let's try to think through that here. Well, the only way we would be applying a D2 differential is if we knew that D1 was zero. So let's suppose we start in the situation where 
d1 of x, which remembers our other box dot in delta 2 of x, is 0. Well, that looks like we took some little x. It went to 1 over p delta y. I'm thinking back to that diagram that we chased through. And then this went to 1 over p delta y bar, where we just reduced mod p. And so we're saying, suppose that's 0. Well, uh, if that's 0, I can go back to my short exact sequence of cochain complexes. I'm going to look at the n plus first level. Oops. Okay, and uh, remember this map on the left is just times p, and this is reduce mod p. So now this 1 over p delta y was something that we chased over to the left side, but it is something that lives in the middle here. Maybe I should make this a different color for chasing's sake. So this is an element of uh, cm plus 1 of x, and what we're assuming here by assuming d1 is 0 on x is that this element maps over to 0 when we reduce mod p, right? That's the second part of our delta 2. This is really uh, first do beta and then reduce mod p. Okay, so uh, if this thing goes to 0, well, this is a short exact sequence. We're exact in the middle. And so there must be something over on the left that hits it. And since this map is multiplication by p, that means we can divide by p again. Let me try to make that more readable. And we get 1 over p squared delta y, and that must map to this. OK, so uh, that's what our d2 differential looks like. We should cook up uh, something where we now divide one more time. And then, of course, we should reduce mod p. OK, so this gives us the idea of what's happening in general for our higher differentials. So in general, if we look at some class x, we apply dr to it and we get 0. Let me make that dr minus 1 just to make it match my notes. Well, then what should dr do it to it, if this is in the kernel of dr minus 1, then it's something uh, in it's something um, in the kernel. So we can apply the next differential when we derive the exact couple again. And so we look at dr of x, and this should just be, well, do the same game, but divide by p r times. And then, of course, take that mod p. OK, and maybe just a quick sanity check. Our dr, I keep writing this in quotes because it's not quite true as written, but I think of it as do j after doing i uh, in reverse r times after doing k. And remember, i was multiplied by p. So this really does say divide by p r times. And now, if you just watched the previous video, on the exact couple, you might notice the indexing looks like it's off by 1. This should be dr plus 1. But really what happened is I sort of started on the 1 page. So uh, our exact couple started with e1 and d1, and then I'm deriving my differentials that way. So the indexing is part of what's confusing about spectral sequences. And part of the problem is, of course, that it's not consistent. All right. so I. Uh, this video is, is getting a bit long, so maybe let me uh, stop just about here. But what's the upshot of what we've said? There should be a Bockstein spectral sequence associated to this exact couple. It's singly graded, so I'll look at E1 and only look at uh, a single grading. And from this derived exact couple, or all of these exact couples taken together, we see that we start with the homology of some space in mod p coefficients. And what we should cook up is the homology of x in integral coefficients. Now I'm going to put that in quotes because um, 
the truth is we haven't really addressed issues of convergence in detail. And here, convergence is even more complicated than usual. Okay, so we, we will come back and talk about convergence in more detail. Once we've got some examples under our belt and we're better at computations. But I sort of want to preemptively say in this case that it's, that it's even more of, of an issue. So normally I'd put converges to this thing if I converge to an associated gradient of some filtration of that object. And here it's not even quite this object. So I will explain what I mean by that as we go on. But let me stop this video here and pick up with the next one.